Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of Beyond the Album Cover, where we get inside the entertainment industry with those in the know and give them their flowers while they're here to be celebrated. My guest tonight has been a part of one of the rap groups that have been in the forefront with Bugging, their cover of Heatwave's classic, Always and Forever, Barbara's Bedroom, right next to me, which was covered by C-Note, which we'll get into in this interview, and many other classics. My man, Jazz from Wessel. Jazz, welcome to Beyond the Album Cover. Thank you, my dude. I appreciate you having me. No problem. So how are you holding up due to COVID and everything? Cause I know it's like a crazy time with people not being able to go out to perform, tour, and things of that nature. So how are you holding up? Well, um, I'm pretty much on the um, the production side of things now and the songwriting side. Um, I'm still, you know, I'm still active, but not as deep as I used to be. So I'm, I have a regular gig and um, my gig is, is what they consider to be an essential worker. So, I mean, you know, we, we take precautions. Um, I do kind of believe I kind of contacted it myself and my daughter um, earlier this year. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm still here because um, I'm not a person that usually gets sick. Like, I don't have really, like, bad allergies, things of that nature. And I was, um, I really had, like, the f a fever, <laughs> like, of 100 and, um, I want to say it was, like, 103, 104. And that's totally, like, unnatural for me. So, and she, and it was a week after she had had supposedly the flu where she tested positive for the flu, but I didn't when I went and got tested so um but nevertheless man you know maintaining trying to do like everybody else is trying to do man um stay solid keep it 1000 um you know there's a lot of things going on um which you know i wouldn't necessarily say covid unearthed but um definitely contribute to it and um i'm just like you know every other black male in America, man, trying to take care of himself, trying to take care of his kids and, and just trying to live and, and stay out of the, the bullseye way, which is a difficult thing to do um, nowadays. But, you know, I'm maintaining. Yeah, I understand that. It's good that you're holding up and everybody is real. Believe signs. It ain't playing. Wear your mask. Take precautions. No be safe. And that's my little spiel. We're not going to get into that. So tell a little bit of everybody about where you were born, musical influences, and were you in any other groups prior to hooking up with Whistle? Um, well, first and foremost, I was born in Brooklyn, New York. I was born in um, the East New York section of Brooklyn. Um, my grandmother had a house there. <clears throat> um, she relocated from her, my grandfather had relocated from, um, South Carolina, um, Newberry, South Carolina. Um, so, you know, I, I was, my mom was born in Bed-Stuy. I was born in, um, East New York. And, um, shortly thereafter, we moved to like Crown Heights, um, in the Park Slope Brook section of Brooklyn when I was real young. Um, then we moved to Crown Heights and I was there probably, I would say from like, um, maybe like there's the third grade from like the third grade until like, um, the, uh, the eighth grade and the eighth grade, we moved from Crown Heights to Flatbush. And, um, that's primarily like in my teen years, like we, when we moved there, I was like 14, um, 13 going on 14 and, um, just uh i grew up there that that's where i ran into um a lot of um a lot of cats that you know were in the industry and, and um i got cool with and stuff like that um but um i would say that my musical influences um prior of course was i guess like every other kid in in the um early 80s definitely um old school rap um i was a i was an r b head too because um you know like my aunts and um my mom listened to of course the you know the greats the luthers the um the barry whites the the temptations the the stevie wonders um the grover washington juniors mahalia jackson clark sisters i mean you name it parliament funkadelic the ohio players switch of course the jacksons marvin gay tammy terrell i mean you name it they they listen to it um stacks um motown and um philadelphia international so i grew up with a lot of that but i also grew up around um 
you know, hip hop, of course, that that's when, you know, and, and, you know, just like coming out of his infancy stages. Um, so Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, of course, um, the Cold Crush Brothers, Grandmaster Kaz, um, Fearless Four, definitely huge for me. Um, Treacherous Three, um, you know, Fantastic Five, all the old school groups like that definitely influenced me um, to feel like I could do you know, what I eventually ended up doing with myself and the guys. Um, I was in a little neighborhood crew, it was called The Sinister. Um, at first it was like The Sinister 2, which was me and another brother by the name of Quan. Then we added different members. It, it eventually became me, myself, uh, um, and my dude, uh, P, uh, Professor P and um, Quan. We added another brother um, by the name of Kurt. And, you know, we just had like a little neighborhood crew. Um, but through that crew, you know, we met a lot of other people around the neighborhood, um, which led me also to eventually meeting Kango and Doobie um, and Silva um, and Howie Chubbs and, and a lot of cats like that. But um, um, the bad boys in East New York, they grew up around my um, my grandmother's block. And um, I spent a lot of my summers there. And actually one of the members, well, two of the members I, I'm, you know what I'm saying, I grew up with basically. They was older than me, but, you know, they was like, not that much older than me, maybe about two to three years. Um, so two of those members I knew very well, um, saw them make their first record. Um, and, you know, just from listening in the basement, man, of the 45s and the albums and, um, you know, listening to the rap tapes, man, that's what really, you know, sparked my um, my interest to, to really feel like I could do it. But, you know, Paul McCartney and Wings, different the Eagles. I was influenced by all, um, you know, all all facets of music, whether it was jazz, R&B, pop, um, adult contemporary, um, you know, rockers, as they used to say. Um, but, you know, like um, dub plays, all any type of music that was dope to me, if it was dope and melodic, I loved it. So digging very, very deep in the crates. Now, I want to paint the picture for those in our audience that may not understand what it was like pre-rap, where you were listening to R&B, pop, rock, and it wasn't very kid-centric. So when rap first came out, it was mind-blowing for kids, where it's like, okay, this is something that I heard in the park jams, but now it's officially on record. Now, before Rapper's Delight, there was King Tim Personality dropped by Fat Bat Band and other records, but Rapper's Delight, when that came out, it kind of gave everybody the idea like, hmm, this can really be legit and be more than just a passing fad. So upon hearing Rapper's Delight, was it where you said to yourself, that's what I want to do? Well, you know, for us in New York, rap before rap was on record it was it was on cassette so we heard it you know as far as um you know like the grandmaster flashes the the um the force the force and c's who later became the force and d's um like i said the furious five um you know the mastodon committee i mean the fearless four crow cross brothers um the fantastic five um you know, the crash crew, it was just different crews that was with Treacherous Three. They they were all doing it on record. They wasn't doing it on record yet, but they were doing it on tape. So we heard it. We heard the routines. We heard the styles um, from the tape. So I think that, um, I don't know if, if when I heard Rapper's Delight, I would say that I thought I could do it. I was already um, trying to do it. I was already trying to like, you know, like write my little routines and, and write my little rhymes. Um, I would say, honestly speaking, um, it became more of a, this is what I want to do when I heard, um, I would say when I heard Fat Boys, man. Mm-hmm. When I heard Fat Boys and, and also, um, It's magic by the Fearless Four. Even though I had been, I had heard, you know, like all Flash and them and was fans, Grandmaster Flash and the Fury Five was like, they like gods to me, them and, and Cold Crush. But, um, you know, Funky Four Plus One More, all that. But when I when I heard that and, and 
heard how like Marky D's voice was, like Prince Marky D, and um, hearing how you know the fearless was with, with Tito, D.O.B., um, Mike C. and and um, Peso. Just just it was just something about especially D.O.B. Um, it was just something about like you know him and Mo D that that um and like i said um um marky d that just made me feel like you know what maybe i could do this too and then we had our little crew and we always like you know well, maybe if we can make a record because you know that was like the thing it was like the thing like okay let's try to make a record i guess like how in the um in the 60s and in the, in the 50s it was the same thing with you know what i'm saying like the motown era like you know if we could cut a record and you know you you doing it and you know, you think you have something, but you really don't know. Um, I don't think that I really knew until like after we did bugging. It to me it was more like, this is what you do if you want, if you want to be taken serious. Then this is how you got to do it. You got to take it serious. But I never thought about it in a respect of like, okay, this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. I always wanted to sing. I I, I remember being in. Um, I want to say I was in. Um, the fifth grade. And um, I I went to Catholic school. So my parents paid for my school. So, you know, you know, Catholic school, they, they you know, you're going to go to college, you're going to be a doctor, a lawyer, something of that nature, engineer, um, or you might, you know, become a civil servant, but especially in New York City. But for me, when they asked me what I wanted to be, I said, I wanted to be a singer. And the class laughed at me. And I remember that. And I remember sitting there like, you know what, I'm going to be a singer one day, watch him be a singer. But I didn't really think about it until when the opportunity was there and I did it. And, you know, we were listening back to Buggin'. I think that's when, not even when I signed a contract, I think when we went in, we did the record and it was completed and I heard the final version, that's when it was like real for me. Now you mentioned Buggin' and Select and Kango Howie T a little bit earlier. Now, were there mm -hmm. any other labels in the bidding war to get you guys signed? And what was that like going to the studio to record the debut album at 86? Well, you know, I met Kango. Um, the funny thing is that I, I was around, um, I was around the group <laughs> and Howie and them, but not around them. And what I mean by that is that, like, I knew people that knew them, and they knew people that knew me, but we hadn't, like, connected So mutual directly. friends, so to speak. Right. So um, when I met Kango, I met Kango on the train. Um, my high school sweetheart at the time, who I, who I dated in high school, um, her two, two best friends that lived on the block with them, one of them was dating Kango. And she was telling me about him. And of course, you know, when you, New York City is 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 big, but it's not that big. Like, especially if you're dealing with areas. You gonna hear who made a record that, because it, it wasn't like that was a commonplace thing, especially rap wise. Um, so when Kango and, you, when UTFO made um, Hanging Out, um, not hanging out, when they made Beats and Rhymes, Beats and Rhymes were their first record. When they made Beats and Rhymes, you know, I, I you know, of course, I heard it on the radio like everybody else on, you know, Mr. Magic and um, WLIB, which was um, the awesome two. And and also like Chuck and them used to have a radio at Delphi um, University. So they was playing stuff like that. And, you know, I heard it. And um, I remember, you know, thinking like it was dope. And, you know, what I'm saying I always thought like their name was dope, like Dr. Ice and Kango Kid and you know what I'm saying, EMD, like I thought it was dope. And um, I ended up actually not meeting Doobie, but we were at a party, a basement party, and I heard him rhyme. And I always thought that he was dope. So fast forward, I meet Kango on the train one day when I'm with um, my ex's, um, you know, best friend, and she used to dance at Alvin Ailey, my, my homegirl, Andrea. So we go, to, I'm going to Alvin Ailey water to watch it, like you know you, you know routine like one of her, one one of her um dance routines with you know with her class and then while we go and can't go doc and e get on the train she introduces me to him you know she asked me if i want to meet him i said yeah she introduces me to him and then we start talking we find out that we got a lot of mutual interests musically you know he sings and rhymes and and um i sing and rhyme and write and 
you know. So we exchange numbers, we hang out. And um, from there, man, we just get cool. Like, you know, he lets me hear Roxanne, Roxanne when they working on it. Um, so I was, you know, I'm, I'm one of the people that was in the loop before that came out. So, you know, it's funny. They had something on Instagram is this dude that, that they have on Instagram. His name is this cross. And I remember he said that, you know, he's like, yeah, can't go an hour. He put the group together, which isn't true. Um, Whistle was formed because by me and Kango hanging out, Doobie, cool Doobie from, from Whistle, lived on his block. Silver Spinner went to school with, with Kango, but he also was UTFO's Rona manager at the time. So me and Doobie just hit it off just by me hanging on hanging around Kango and being on the block. And then when Kang would go on the road, when Doob would come home from school, because he was at the University of Maryland at the time, when he would come home from school, I would cut school and hang out with him. So that's how me and Doobie got to be cool. And then we just decided, like, you know, let's form a group. And at first we called ourselves Too Tough. I know it's funny now, but back then it was, you know, we too TWO, you know, like tough So <laughs> for me and him. So that was what we formed before we actually formed the group Whistle. Um, so my Kang was on the road. Kango would call me with different ideas. Like he called me when he wrote Barber's Bedroom. Um, he called me... Um, when he um when he came up with the chorus for for bugging kango wrote the chorus for bugging so he called me one day this week before we formed the group and he was just telling me about different ideas and i told him that me and doobie had formed a group and he was like cool i wanted to work with both of y'all individually anyway so we're gonna work with you then doobie had the suggestion of putting silver in the group for a dj because silver um he had heard silver um like basically um sound checks Mixmaster Ice turntables before he got on. And he said Silver was nice. So I said, all right, cool. So do we thought he was nice? Do we was a leader whistle still is? Um, if he felt like he was good, cool. Then we put him in. So we put him in. And um, you know, of course, we couldn't call ourselves too tough. So me, Kango, and, and Doobie is sitting around. And <laughs> Kango basically says, Yo, why don't we call the group? And of course, I'm young now. Now, when I made bugging, I'm like 17. So my first response was like, yo, that's some some punch. You know what I'm saying? Like, they gonna think we soft, call whistle. And then Doobie was like, yo, that's dumb. Like, if anything, I'd rather the group be called whistle before we call it. <laughs> so Kango was like, yo, that's the name of the group. So that's how we came up with the name of the group for whistle. Um, but anyway, back to bugging, um, Kango caught me off the road once we formed whistle. And... Um, he told me he had an idea and he told me, he, you know, he, he sang the chorus, you know, to, to bug it. And he was like, I right, write the routine. So I went back and then I wrote the routine um, that me and Doobie said. And then, um, then me and Doobie both wrote our individual rhymes and then me and Kango wrote um, the end part of the um, of bugging as far as Silver's part. Um, but that's how we would do stuff, man. Um, and, and, you know, when we went in and did bugging, it was just really like, Bugging was truly an idea of all five of us, me, Kango, Howie, Silver, and Doobie. Silver brought the record that says Bugging to Howie's house. Kango came up with the musical part of Bugging. Um, I want to, I don't know if it was him and Howie. I think it was him and Howie, but they had the music before we actually had like the bugging bug, bug, bug. before we had that we they had the music but silver brought that record to to howie and how we you know sampled it and of course had it play um just like a lot of people don't know that ending part of um the record when it goes bang, 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 when we rhyme that's actually from inspector gadget can't go sample that because <laughs> he heard it in his head and he said yo i'm gonna play it and that's what he did. So that's a lot of that stuff is just how we did it, man. We we um, you know, Kang would have an idea. Um, I I be I wouldn't even take away his credit by not saying that he had a lot of ideas, and um, he would bring it to us, and um, we would try to you know emulate his idea or or, or his vision that he would bring to us. Um, the first album, I would say, was probably um. I would say it was the most fun to work on because we were young and we were just 
And, you know, we were just doing what we loved. We didn't have any pressure. We just felt like we're going to go in, we getting to go in and make an album. You know what I'm saying? Like Run DMC has done and, and um, L has done and Fat Boys have done and Curtis Blow has done. That's that's how UTFO has done. That's how we looked at it, that we were getting an opportunity. Um, we never really thought about doing R&B and, and um, hip hop together. What it was is that was a Kango idea. I sang. You know what I'm saying? And Kango felt like, you know, because I sang and I rhymed and he felt like I did both good. He wanted to showcase that talent and he couldn't do that in UTFO. You know what I'm saying? He didn't have that flexibility, but with us, he did. You know what I'm saying? He could give us ideas and we was like, all right, Kango, cool. And we would just do it or we would add to him or do whatever. But um, those first three albums, especially the third album, um, was the first two albums was was Kang and Howie a lot produced it. Um, we tried to come in on the second album and, and bring up ideas, but I don't think we were were ready yet. I think that um, that was probably one of our worst albums. Not that we didn't enjoy what we did, but it's it just wasn't. Um, I wouldn't say it wasn't real, but I would say that it wasn't. I think we was we would. We were doing what we thought we should do based on what we saw out there as a verse to sitting down as we did on the first album and really coming up with like ideas for ourselves and collaborating. It, it wasn't a lot of collaboration on the second album. How he was on his way out as far as producing, he really wasn't feeling producing us anymore. Um, at least that's what was brought to us, whether it was true or not. We never discussed it. I mean, we cool now. I mean, we never really had no beef, but that's how it was brought to us. Um, and, um, you know, we just tried to regroup on the third album um, with Always and Forever. And in and, and between that time, we just decided that um, we wanted to go in the more R&B section, the R&B direction, because it's kind of like, you know, when Karis won Public Enemy and um, I would say, I wouldn't say Kane, because Kane and them came out a little bit before that. But I think when, when Rakim came out, and um and then you had Cool G rap. We wasn't rhyming like that. So we was we was that we were a happy group. We was the you know, we was the I mean in real life we was Brooklyn dudes, but you know on record we was happy go lucky dudes. And rap changed, and I don't think that we grew with it. And um, I think we was kind of you know we came out a certain period. We was stuck in that period, and we just decided that R&B was the more a better direction that we needed to go into. Kanga was still producing this at the time. We discussed it with him. And um, that's when we brought in Turk and that's when Doobie left. Um, and we became like Whistle the R&B group. All right. And you mentioned that right around the debut album in 86 that you wanted to mesh R&B and rap. And like I was telling a little people bit. all of the time that that was kind of the precursor to what was later to come with New Jack Swing with Teddy Riley and everything like that. But I tell people that full force, you know, laid the groundwork yes, yes, sir. with their work yes, with sir. UTFO, Lisa, Lisa, so on and so forth. So can you tell me a little yes, bit about yes, your interactions with full force, if any? Um, we didn't really have any musical interactions with full force. Um, where, where, excuse me, where Kango and Doobie lived. Um, it wasn't that far from where Craze lived. It wasn't that far from um, Sean Penn, Little Sean, um, Chub Rock, um, of course, Howie. Um, I would probably say I probably lived the furthest because I was in Flatbush and they lived in East Flatbush, um, full force as well. So I went to East Flatbush. I hung out in East Flatbush. That's how... You know what I'm saying? Like I, I got around like Chubbs and, and Craze and um Sean and and Kango, Doobie, Silver, all the rest of those cats um was from me hanging in, in East Flatbush. Um but I was around and I would say we Doobie may have had a little bit more interaction because he played football and they played football. It was you know what I'm saying, it was different things that they did on outside of music. Um, but for me, when I came, when I came in the game, um, well, when I, I won't say when I came in the game, when I, when I came into that, that circle, um, I don't know the history. I don't know anything that's going on and so on and so forth, but there was a lot of, um, 
not direct anger towards us, but Kango in full force had a little tension because I guess they figured that, you know, full force, this whole thing was in house. You know what I'm saying? You had the full force family. You had Lisa Lisa and Cult Jam. You had Real Roxanne. You had UTFO. You had full force. You had Cheryl Pepsi Riley. You know what I'm saying? Um, and then you had Howie. Howie was part of their production. Howie was part of the full force family. Um, you know, he did the drums on, I think him and B did the drums on, on, or it may have been Howie or maybe B because B do drums to be fine from full force. But I think they on Alice, I think Howie did the drums on that, um, temporary love thing. I think he did the drums on that. Um, you know, like different UTF, you know, different, um, UTFO records. He worked closely with them sometimes on stuff. Um, so we didn't have really any interaction, but I saw their greatness. I saw, um, I think that they are, are definitely underrated and not given the props that they deserve um, as far as, um, you know, that bringing that element of hip hop and R&B together because they always had it, you know what I'm saying? From their first album, like they always, you know, they was Brooklyn dudes, you know what I'm saying? They was Caribbean dudes, but they was Brooklyn dudes and, and they brought that in their music. Um, I never felt like their music wasn't, you know, dope or banging or, you know, hip hop feel. I think that what happened with Full Force was even though they was Brooklyn dudes, their image was super polished. And I think, and and not even in a not a negative way. It was like that's what you did. That's what R and B groups look like. If you think about Cameo, if you think about, you know what I'm saying, um, for the full force era. Like if you think about how Cameo transformed and you know what I'm saying, how um um ready for the world and and you know, different groups looked, you know what I'm saying? You had some that was on the wild side, parliament style, and then you had some that was polished and full force was polished. And I think that, you know, even though their music was dope, I think that visually, you know, out as far as New York was concerned, I don't think that they got the props that they, they should have. And I don't think that they get the props that they that they do. I think that when people think about hip hop and R&B a lot of times, um, I think like, no, and it's no disrespect. Like, you know, I think like Teddy um, gets a lot of props. I think, um, especially the Uptown camp gets a lot of props. Um, but it started, the first ones that I heard do hip hop and R&B as far as R&B is concerned was Full Force. That, mm -hmm. that, was, that was the closest thing to what I heard as far as hip hop R&B, which we know now know today was full force unselfish lover with big b come on man <laughs> you know what i'm saying like you can't front on that like them they they you know what i'm saying it scratches in it it was you know what i'm saying they joints was was banging and they had hard beats you know what i'm saying like you know you felt it when you was in the whip it was like you know they just was overlooked i think they was just overlooked man and, and not given the props that they deserve you could definitely hear the influences of all the greats the kashifs the the surfaces and a lot of other different um 80s cats that that was out that full force was just as good as man as far as songwriters and producers you they don't get the props that they deserve and they deserve a lot of props and i learned a lot um through them through kango but kango was a product of them so the things that he taught me i knew came from them because he would he would kango would would, would sit down with me and pick apart notes and songs and riffs like that's the type of stuff he would do around me he'd be like yo you see that way he did that and if it was b5 if it was paul if it was 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 um lou if it was new edition it didn't matter who if it was a dope he would he would do stuff like that with me he would make me do mad harmonies because that's what full force did you know what i'm saying they they super stacked their harmonies so he would do that with me and 
due to the fact that I was the only singer, a lot of time I would do most of the harmonies until Craze and Turk came in the group. But before that, it would be me or they would bring in like background singers and be me. But, you know, it, you know, it, I would say that that's, that's probably like the closest. I definitely felt they influenced it, but it was through Kango. Mm, yeah, definitely go to YouTube. Check out my throwback interview with Bo Legged Lou. Everybody got to see the greatness of Full Force as production and songwriting team. Once all I have to give by Backstreet Boys became a huge smash worldwide. No doubt. No doubt. And then, of course, they did uh, I Just Want to Be With You, which was an album cut off of NSYNC's. Uh, debut album here in the states but it wasn't released as a single and they did i believe some stuff for britney spears but i think it didn't make the cut off of um hit me baby one more time it was a record called mm -hmm. love the hurt away i believe and it was like all cried out part two hmm. i could believe it dope dope record and i was like man yeah. why it wasn't never released as a single now talking about the transcon camp I first heard this record through a group called C Note, which I felt should have blown up more in America, but for some reason they never did. They did a cover of Right Next to Me. Now, how did mm -hmm. that record come about? Because those chords, super pretty, and that record should have been a pop AC hit. Um, Kango. Kango wrote that. He wrote it. He did the music, everything. Um, that was just a Kango thing, man. He was, he was um you know, he was, um, I don't really want to tell his story behind the, the song because I know it, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, but it, it, I wouldn't say it's, it's a true story. I would say it was um, what he was feeling at the time, what he was going through with, um, you know, in, in, in his personal, in a situation. And he wrote it because I remember when he wrote it and he, he was telling me about it and where it came from. Um, but that was just Kango, man. That that was Kang. Um, Kang wrote and produced all three. Of, well, we have four albums and we have a greatest hits album. But Kango wrote and produced all of the R&B stuff on the third album. Except for always and forever and chance, always and forever and still my girl, because I wrote still my girl, um, and um, this these other two cats did the music. Um, Adrian Tank McCray and I forgot the other dude, but Tank used to manage us in the beginning when we first used to um, when we first did whistle. He also did another record on the second album, falling in love with um his partner Chance. Um, but that was Kango, man. Um, you know Kang. Just like Kang did the music for Chance for I Love. Um, how he did the drums, I mean, they produced it, but Kango did the music for Chance for I Love, and Chance for I Love was a song that I just wrote, um, and Kango literally put the music around it. Um, and Still My Girl was just a record that, like I said, Adrian Tank McRae did. But, um, you know, Kango just, you know, he, he <laughs> Kango has this thing with me when it comes to ballads. He just likes to hear me sing ballads. He'll do mid-tempos and up-tempos, but he just, he's always had this thing with me and my voice that he felt like I should just be doing ballads and slow joints and mid-tempo joints. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a story I've never told anybody. Um, well, I have, but I've never told it out in the open. Um <laughs> That was the last song on the second album. And um, when we first put Crazy in the group, right, Kango gave him a really, really hard way to go because he wanted to prove himself because he felt, you know, Kango came from that old school, um, that old school vibe of this is the crew. You know what I'm saying? You could leave, but we don't, you know, replacements, he ain't really big on stuff like that or adding things, whatever, whatever. It, it got to make sense to him. And even though Craze is, is an incredible singer um, and performer, he just wasn't on board like that um, in the beginning. So he was just really on some, yo, he can sing, but he's going to do Adler stuff. He really wasn't like big on giving him a lead at that point. Um, so I was supposed to sing um, right next to me. 
but I felt like Crazer's voice needed to be heard. And I felt like we was doing him a real injustice by not giving him leads on the song. Because at that time, he was a better singer than I was. I mean, I could sing. I could hold my own. But Craze was better than me at that point. Um, and I felt like it, the world needed to hear him sing. So I acted like I, I lost my voice. And, and and I remember Kango being mad. But he was like, man, we got to get the song done. So he let Craze sing it. And Craze killed it. Man, and that's and then we get we yeah yeah and that's and we got two remakes, blank um black did it and C note did it but black did it too. Oh man, I did. They used to be like left eyes group. Yeah, yeah, black black did it too. Man, now you were mentioning about how Craze coming into the group and how you had to pretty much fake losing your voice in order to get him some time. It almost to get him to sing on uh, uh, just that. Now after that he. You know, right. Kane was, you know, he was good with him, but that's that one. That was the last song. I just did that. Right. I don't know. He doesn't even know that. So right. if they see this interview, they could be like, what? Nobody knows that. I did that. Wow. Exclusive. But I was saying how it almost kind of sounds sort of similar how when Johnny Gill first came in the new edition and how they just had him doing ad libs and backgrounds because it was very focused on Ralph until you got to King mm-hmm. Stand the Rain and Boys the Men and then the back half of yeah. the Heartbreak album, you got to hear right. what Johnny could do and how Johnny, it made right. sense with him coming into the group. Yeah. yeah, And like I said, um, I mean, you know, Kane was just really, you know, when he gets stuck on a vision, he's hard to come off that vision. But um, but he warmed up to the idea, you know what I'm saying? And eventually, you know, Crazy and I became the lead singers. Um Along with Turk, because Turk would do some leads too. And, um, you know, we, we eventually, you know, rounded it out as far as the group was concerned, um, especially when it was the four of us. Right. Now, were there, so, some, um, were there some regions that you were surprised that Whistle was hitting so hard at outside of the tri-state northeast area, like the Midwest, West Coast, Southeast, whenever you go out and tour? Um... I probably would say, if I had to say the place that surprised me the most would probably be, I would say, DC. Like, DC surprised me. Um, Because it's so close to New York, they're real big go-go fans. But the funny thing is that because Buggin kind of swung, they liked it. It had that go go swing. And too. then yeah. And then and they loved Chance for Our Love. They loved Still My Girl. They loved Barbara's bedroom. They just I I couldn't even tell you, dog. Back back for the I mean, because back then, see me and Whistle, not the group, but the jazz from Whistle and the jazz from now. I have a real love hate. <laughs> situation with that because where I am now as far as a singer is concerned and a songwriter is concerned compared to where I was then it's like you know it's like yeah I, you know we did this and we did that but it was so much other things that I felt like we was untapped to do um, individually especially me like, you know, I, I wanted to do a lot and I, w- I wanted to learn a lot, which is where Free came in and, and where I learned a lot from Kango too. Um, but I don't, I don't, you know, I guess for me, then it was so much, okay, formula. Um, I really didn't pay attention to stuff like that, I guess, because I was young, man. I was really young, like, you know what I'm saying? I wasn't, I was like, Buggin came out in 85. I was 17. But by the time Buggin took off, I was just turning 18. That that following April, because my birthday's in April. And so it was, it was like one minute, you know what I'm saying? We doing shows where people are just looking at us like we crazy and then the next minute we doing shows where people is like asking to meet us uh it was you know i'm an 18 year old kid man you know that's going around the world i'm not really thinking about it like that i'm thinking about 
you know, silliness, clothes, jewelry, girls, you know what I'm saying? Not trying to get caught cheating, stupid stuff like that. I'm not, and I'm just being honest. Right. I'm not really, I'm not, I'm, I'm not really gathering or, or, or really absorbing, um, the magnitude of, of what is actually going on around us. Um, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to, you know, and that's, I guess that's because that's how I am. Like, even when it comes to anything, like being a father, being a, 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 a husband, being a, whatever, I'm more of a, if this is what I'm supposed to do, then I'm just going to do it because that's what I'm supposed to do. It is. I don't really get in the intricacies of it. I don't look into after the fact, but during it, nah. This is what we supposed to do. This is what I do. Um, so I think that's how I was then. I wasn't. I didn't even know me yet musically. I was trying to find me. I was really emulating. I was. I, I'm a good person. You can put me in a situation and freak it. I, and, and if you ask free, free to tell you this. I'm probably the only person, me and my my brother, rest in peace, Will Skills, who was in group home with me, that can listen to free and sing it exactly the way he wanted. And plus add our own style to it. That's just how I am. If you tell me that's what you want me to do, I'm going to figure it out and I'm going to do it. Musically, that's just what I've always done. So back then, I was more, I was, I was more of jazz, this is what you do. So I did it. As a verse to jazz, what do you think you should do? You understand what I'm trying to say? It was like, yo, this is the theme of the record jazz. Okay. It wasn't, yo, Kang. You know, rarely, every once and again, I'd be like, yo, Kang, man, I got this idea for a chorus. How you like it? And if he liked it, we would do it. Right. So or if the group liked it, we would do it. Right. Yeah. So it almost kind of felt like it was like how in the recording business, you had your reference track or your guide tracks, and you kind of followed it step for step and... Then later on, as you progress, you start to find your foot and add your own flavor to it and then develop as mm -hmm. a writer right. and as a singer yourself, mm -hmm. right? But see, we never had reference tracks. <laughs> we didn't have reference tracks. Kango would sing it. Kango would do it or somebody else would do it. We would learn it and I would hear it and I would know the cadences like that. We wouldn't necessarily have reference tracks. Like we, we he wouldn't do references. He would just, we would just go in there and do it, whatever it was, rhyming, um, singing, it didn't matter. It, we didn't have references. Like we didn't, we come from the old school point to where it's like you had to sing every time the chorus comes. Perfect. Like that's what, that's what we did. So when people sit up there and they'd be like, oh man, you sing. And I'm sitting there like, dog, I'm a singer, singer. Like I had to sing every time. Like I had to get it right. Like, so if that was 98 takes, that was 98 takes. If that was like, yo, we didn't finish that night because Jazz didn't get it. He got to come back tomorrow. Or Craig's got to come back tomorrow. That's what it was. That's that's what I grew up in. Mm -hmm. Now it's digital where you can do it perfect once and they can move it around. But when I came in, no, nah, it wasn't like that. Yeah, because <laughs> not Tom, even with group home. Yeah, because Tom w literally was money because you had to pay for that studio time. Yes. You better make sure your Paul was yes. right because it was coming out of somebody's check or your advance budget. Yeah. Yeah, my 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 budget. Yeah, our budget. Um, but yeah, man, I, I you know I didn't really think about it like that. I I would probably say DC surprised me the most, but it wasn't because it was the type of love we got. <clears throat> it was like, yo, we like y'all, man. It was it was it was like from like when we did video soul with Donnie Simpson, or if we went to a club, or. It, it was always love. Like DC was so much love that I thought I was going to end up living there. Like my son is from, like his mom is from DC. He's like my oldest son. Trust me. It was, it was, it was DC was just one of them places that, and you know what it was with DC too. They loved us, but DC was the first place as a black man that I saw a young black men and women working for the government, working for different things, taking care of their lives, do, re, having their own apartment. And I'm talking about like 18, 19, 20, 21. That was like, I'm at home with my mom at 18, man. All of us was living at home with our mothers. All of us. I think, you know what I'm saying, eventually like Kang moved out and I moved out and, 
you know, all the rest do be moved in it. But in the beginning, nah, man, we was all with our mothers. <laughs> like all of us was with, at home. So when I saw that at DC, that was motivation too. And then it was the love that we got. So I would say probably there. Now we got love in Virginia. We got love in Ohio. Um, uh, North Carolina. That's where I live now. North Carolina showed us love um, back in the days. Um, Georgia. I would probably say those are the ones. Texas. Texas showed us love too. Um, but definitely oh, upstate New York. So, I mean, you know, we had some places that showed us love that when we put out a joint, it would it would definitely, we knew it was going to bubble there. Um, but I would probably say D.C. is... D.C. was one of those places that no matter what we put out, maybe not the, the last album, but the first three albums, whatever, we put out something, they played it. Like, right. if it was a single, they played it. Yes. Right. And it was definitely back in the days when you used to have regional records where a record didn't mm -hmm. pop in a certain area, but it popped in another area. And that would be yes, that sir. region's record. Because Chance for Our mm -hmm. Love, when I hear that record, to me, I envision middle school, high school slow dance, mm -hmm. blue light basement. Mm -hmm. And when you try to get your first slow dance with a girl or your mm -hmm. first number, some of you who are old enough to remember no, exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about. But me, I was the wallflower. I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I, I guess I'm glad I'm old enough to be glad that I contributed <laughs> to that. Um, of course, I wasn't thinking about it at the time, but you know, I'm glad that I did contribute to, to that. Um, but yeah, man. Um, you know, we, we, we. Um, we definitely wanted to be taken serious. I can't say this. What motivated us, which a lot of people don't know either, um, we're always in forever. Not the record always in forever, because there's a story behind that too, but the album. The second album had like bombed. And that's when we decided we was gonna make that transition. And Doobie had left. And um, and at this point, you know, Craig is already in the group, Silver's still in the group, I'm I'm in the group. We don't know Turk can sing. We cool with Turk. We've met him. You know what I'm saying? We 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 intrigued by Turk's business mind. We don't know he can sing. And then one day one of his boys um was like, yo, Turk, man, why you ain't never sing for the guys? And he was like, he was like, yeah, Turk, what? Because we hanging out with him in DC. And um he starts to sing, man, and he kills it. And and Turk's like a big Luther Vandross fan. So he sings, A House is not a home. Yo, this man killed this so much. I caught my mother and I said, mommy, listen to, to, to this guy that I want to put in the group. And I told him to sing Superstar to her. And she's like, Brian, you need to put him in the group. That was another one Kanga was fighting me on and the label. So I brought Turk in and I said, listen, just let him sing Superstar. If he don't blow you away, I'll leave it alone. We ain't got to put him in the group. So they said, okay. So Turk comes up there and he sings Superstar. <laughs> Gangle dropped his head. He was like, I can't, I can't say nothing because he killed it. And and we put him in the group. Um, and then we went and did always and forever. But what maybe really what motivated us is we were sitting at Turk's house and the box. I don't know if you remember the box you oh, had to yes, pay to watch course. the video. Okay. The box is on. Music that you so we letting it right, but we letting it play because we Second album was there. We broke. We ain't got no money. So we sitting there. <laughs> we sitting there in Turk's crib, and we just gonna watch whatever play. Cause you know, usually they gonna play. Um, sorry, brother. I had a call that came through. They gonna usually play. Um, whatever comes on, and um, we sitting there, and if it is in love, came on. And I look at Craze and I was like, that's what we got to become. New edition. We got to, not necessarily, not only like new edition, but at that point, new edition was was definitely our temptations, our our age group's temptations. Um, but then you had True. And you had, you know, um, well, Portrait wasn't out necessarily yet. And Tony, Tony, Tony was more of a band. So I would say you had us, you had Troop, and you had New Edition. And we would transition into an R&B group, you know what I'm saying, of singers. So 
it was like, it, it not necessarily, it got to be five of us, but the same way you had the spinners, the same way you had the temps, the same way that you had um, the whispers, the whispers, you had the four tops. You had Smokey Robinson and the Miracles. You know what I'm saying? Gladys Knight and the Pips. You had these four, you had these four person groups that were also dynamic. And that's what we tried to become when we did Always and Forever, the album. Mm-hmm. Now who we tried I- to evolve to that. Yeah. Now who idea was to have you guys cover the Heat Wave classic, Always and Forever. Now I told you this prior to doing this interview. That was the first time I ever heard of the record prior to going back and listening to Heat Waves as a kid. And that mm-hmm. ballad, beautiful, beautiful you, record. Bro. And you guys did Heat Wave justice. Thank you. Thank you. Um well, that was another Kango. <clears throat> um, but it wasn't, it wasn't like Kang just came up with it. What it was is that we wanted to do a remake because, you know, we, 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 we were like huge Quiet Storms fan. And if you know anything about the D, any lifestyle, really, any nightlife, but especially New York City lifestyle and Washington, D.C. lifestyle, especially D.C., when you come and leave the club in D.C., the Quiet Storm is playing. So they used to have back in the days, this is in the eighties, DC used to have this like double play. And if you had did a remake, they would play the original and then they'd play the remake. So, you know, we wanted to do over, um, I'm a, I'm a huge D train fan. Like James D train Williams. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a I'm a huge D Train fan. He's and he's from Brooklyn. So I'm a huge D Train fan. So I wanted to do over um You're the Reason. Um really, really badly. Um that's like my one of my favorite songs. And um me and Turk thought thought about it's so hard to say goodbye to yesterday. So from the movie, because you know we seen Cooley High. And um so we tried to get it from whatever reason. The group didn't really want to do You're the Reason. So we all decided to do It's So Hard to Say Goodbye to Yesterday. So when we tried to get it, Boys the Men wasn't out yet, but had signed to Motown and was redoing it. So Motown was like, we already got one of our acts doing it. So they wouldn't give us, of the course, to do it. the clearance to do it. So then um, Kango came up with... Um, Kango and, and um, Turk came up with the idea for Always and Forever. And then I was like, all right, cool. Because I didn't want to sing it. So I, I'm just thinking Crazy and Turk going to sing it. So I, you know, I didn't mind. Like, okay, we're just we going to do Always and Forever. You know what I'm saying? And for whatever reason, when 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 Craze tried to sing the whole song and when Turk tried to sing the whole song, he just wasn't feeling it they wasn't feeling it none of them not even the group they wasn't feeling it and i walked in because i came to the session late and i walked in and they all <laughs> looked at me and kango was like yo jazz you gotta sing it i was like nah man i can't sing always in forever man like this ain't this ain't this ain't one of them songs you just do man like you really got to you know what i'm saying yeah you got to come with it like people redo records but they ain't always banging like what Troop did for All I Do Is Think Of You, yo, you might, and I'm not saying that the Jackson version ain't dope or none of that, because it is. The original is crazy. But if you compare, like, Mother's Finest version of Love Changes to Kashif's and Melissa Morgan's and, you know, All I Do Is Think Of You by Troop to, to the Jacksons, and like Dolly Parton's I Will Always Love You to Whitney Houston, it's a difference, man. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, you know, when intro did over Ripping in the Sky, it's dope. I mean, it ain't better than Stevie's, no way. Same thing with Lately, it's not better than Stevie's, but they did something to it. They brought something to it. You got to do it like that, man. And I don't think a lot of people do it like that. And I, and I don't, I, you know, it's like you, you... I understand everybody want to have their own version and a viewpoint of it, but sometimes you got to leave it alone. And then sometimes, you know what I'm saying? You got to really bring something and add to it. And I think, um, 
you know, I, I'm I'm never going to sit here and say that there, that our version is just as good as the original. I'm just not going to do that. Um, I, I respect everybody's opinion that feels that way. Um, but I'm a humble dude. And I know that I'm not nowhere near. I didn't bring it nowhere near the vibe that, that you know what I'm saying, um, the lead singer brought to that to that record man um and i know his first name was johnny i, I can't remember what his, his last J- name johnny was johnny wilder i believe johnny wilder wilder i knew his first name was johnny and i remember he had wrote us a letter man um complimenting us on on how we on the job that we did um but that was kango man that was a lot of that a lot of that ballad and beautifulness and all the rest of that stuff that was kango man that that was kang and and you know it, that was just him that was just what he heard man i i can't we can't i i wasn't musically then i had my own ideas but i really didn't think the group would feel it or kango would feel it so i just didn't say nothing so when it came to music i really wasn't there when they was creating stuff i came after the fact Mm. or we added something to it i'd be like yo do this or do that but musically back then with the with the with the first four albums i wasn't i wasn't even um i wasn't even really involved in that that's why like after i left whistle i got really really heavy in learning production and 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 wanting to hear the music because i had these ideas in my head but nobody was really that we were working with was really touching it other than free. Right. So that's how I me and free linked up. Right. And it's funny that you mentioned about it's so hard to say goodbye because I didn't know that you guys wanted to do it, but boys to men beat you all to the punch. Yeah. For those of you yeah. that don't know, it's so hard to say goodbye yes. off a of cool eye soundtrack, which was originally mm-hmm. done by GC Cameron, who was a member of the spinners. Mm-hmm. So how did you and Free end up hooking up? Well, when we were working on the um, the last album, um, one of the A and R's he's passed away now, but one of the A and R's at Select, um, his name is Greg Riles. Um, Greg had he just he knew Free. He knew Free from Free used to, which he probably talked about. He knew Free from the the, the garage days when he was touched. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And when Free was playing in like unlimited, you know, you know, running around with like unlimited touch and, and um Sandy, his mentor and, and them cats. Um, he knew Free from them. And my man Joe Ski Love, who was like Free's little brother, um, me and Joe was close at the time. And Joe was telling me about Free. He was like, yo, you need to hook up with my brother, you need to hook up with my brother. I'm telling you, he got some stuff. And um, this is like after they had done two hype. Um, him and Eric, and um, you know, he he came to this. He came to you know, Greg was like, "Yo, Jazz, you need you need to sit down and listen to him." So I was like, "All right, cool." So he came and he brought some stuff, and I loved it. And um, he ended up doing "Show You." Um, this these records show you I am and Mister I Love Your Daughter, and he let me write the the first verse to Mister I Love Your Daughter, and um. We just we, we just hit it off, man. We just me and Free just um he he just you know when we when we met he was like yo I always love whistle he said I love your voice, and from that point on we was just like inseparable. Um, we was chilling together. We I was hanging in the Bronx, you know, um, go to his sessions, um, go up to his, his you know what I'm saying um when he lived with his mom's off of Gun Hill I you know all it well not Gun well he used he moved back to Gun Hill and I was up there with him for a little while um you know um doing, with his first wife but um you know just just we just hooked up man and we just had this love for music and free you know I wanted to learn how to produce and I went to him after I left Whistle and I was like he asked me he's like what you gonna do I said I want to produce and you're gonna teach me and he started laughing he said you serious I was like yeah and he did and and he also he also got in my pen game um to whereas I really got really really he opened he helped me open my mind when it come, came to writing um and he helped me 
cultivate me as far as an artist and as far as a singer is concerned. He helped me find my voice. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, he's always going to be my, him and Kango are my musical OGs. I, I can't front on them. Um, but it's something different about Free because Free allowed me to be me. He wasn't interested in jazz from whistle. He was interested in jazz. Like he wanted to see who I was. Like he he heard things and he and he knew I could do things. So he would push me and he would um put me in uncomfortable positions as far as singing is concerned and writing was concerned, um, to push me, to elevate me. Um, and that's what it did, man. And that's probably that time period which was probably, I would say, like, 92 to probably, like, 95, 96. Yo, that's, like, the greatest, my 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 greatest moment in music. Like, even though nobody knows it, I love that era. Because I was, I was around in Tume. I was around, you know, um, McKinley Horton. They used to work with Philadelphia International. Um... I got to sit around All Star. We had we um, All Star when he was working with SWV, um, nice and smooth. Um, YZ, um, you know, even people that really wasn't really well known. My man Fresco, um, this, this group, um, etc. Um, also Eric, being around Eric and and um, and Free. Um, my man Fendi, my homie Tuffy. I mean, it was just it was just a lot of musical. It was like we were like the soul aquarians before the soul aquarians. You know what I'm saying? Like we had all these people around us and we was doing all this stuff, but nobody heard it because we were all, you know, like this secret for Vincent, this 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 um the secret weapon that he was gonna release with Group Home and Fendi and all the rest of us. So um yeah, man, free free. Um, like my partners now, my musical partner um, and best friend, my man Mike. I met him by being around Free. Um, you know, I'm in a, I have a, my own production group now. I'm um, called the Real. With it's myself, my best friend Mike, and my best friend Norris Bridges, Norizi. Um, and you know, even if you were to speak to Mike, Free, you know, Free got something about him musically. He's like a he. <laughs> It's like if Prince was was a hood dude, <laughs> like that. <laughs> yo, if, I, that's the best way I could put it. If Prince was a was a hood dude, like if Prince was born in the Bronx, yo, he'd be free. Man, and like I'm just so serious. Yeah, and you mentioned Joski Love earlier. For those of you that don't know, Joski yeah. Love Pee Wee Dance. Look Pee-wee's it up. Dance, yes sir. And I believe Ice T was in the video for that. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. And he was also yes, he was. in Joe the first was- breaking. Yeah, Joe was probably like, if you want to say my 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 celebrity friend, Joe was like my first celebrity friend that I met on the road. Like Joe was the first dude that I met on the road outside of Whistle, and he and I just was like together. We was on the Fresh Fest together, um, and back at '86, mm. and we the same age. So yeah. Now for the Fresh Fest, for those of you that don't know, the first big hip hop tour that sold out stadiums was put together by Michael Malden, who was Jermaine Dupri's yes. dad, who was a dancer on the Fresh Fest. And also I she didn't was. know this until it was an episode of Video Music Box that was on YouTube. I don't know if it's still on or not. There was a yes, young kid that was on the bill besides JD. He was singing and crushing my girl, Chad. And I didn't know that that was the same Chad that would later become Dr. Seuss. I did not yes. know that. Yeah, that's Chad. That's Chad. Yeah. Jersey. Yeah, I thought <laughs> that, that was so dope. Yeah. And then with the Rough Riders Chronicles, didn't know that he did some of DMS's first singles when he first got his single deal, I believe, on Rough House. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. I mean, Chad, dog, music, as far as New York is concerned, and Jersey, in in philly um i would say connecticut um but even up to upstate new york that there's a lot of untapped um tapped and untapped musical greatness i would say philly don't get the hip-hop props it deserves philly get a lot of r&b props and soul props because you know what i'm saying 
because of Philadelphia International, because of Soul Aquarians, Jill Scott, Fruits, those, music. you know what I'm saying? Oh, Jaguar um, music, you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, th those, those, those cats. But, you know, Philly hip hop scene is crazy, B. Like, those dudes be crazy spitting. Like, but they don't get it. But if you think about New York, we don't get the R&B props that we should get. Because New York put out spitters and point guards. And and that's what and that's what people recognize us for. But but for real, for real, rock wise, R and B wise, and pop wise, dog, it's so many listen, man, there's so many people that I have come across in music that that in New York City, to whereas like you just knew they was gonna blow. And they never did. You just knew because that's how good they were. Mm -hmm. They was just they was just nice like that. Like they was just, you know, man, my homegirl Khadija, yo, she had sang on Ain't No Nigga by Jay-Z, but she uh, she she actually is on the second whistle album. We did a duet with her called The Mirror of Love. Right? Mm -hmm. And her on her homegirl. Um me can't go crazy and, and you well, you know, whistle, but we did the joint. Crazy. Um there's a songwriter, singer songwriter, Andrea Martin, that wrote um, "Before You Walk Out of My Life" by um, by Monica. Crazy vocal skills and 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 wrote um, "Don't Let Go" by Vogue. Oh, New wow. York City, New York. I'm just saying, it's it's so much stuff that that sit around, like you said, Chad, um, Bob and them is from Jersey, Naughty today. by Nature, and everybody. To, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, today. Mm -hmm. um, Shamar out of Connecticut. You know what I'm saying? It, it's it's so many people that's there. You know what I'm saying? Look at what Griselda's doing. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Um, it's 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 just untapped potential, man. Yeah. And I think I, I, all over the world, period. But it's just to me, I feel like you know what hurts us musically is when we forget where we came from. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And we got this thing to where we do this infighting a lot as a race, as a people, and as a music. If you look at any other, you know what I'm saying, genre of music, there's no infighting like that. It's either embraced or not, but usually it usually gets embraced. But us, old always fights new. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. and a lot of times, sometimes, and sometimes new doesn't respect the old. Right. At different in different regards. And and I'm gonna give you an example. I remember when people was disrespecting James and James Brown and them when we were sampling them instead of revering them and understanding where they came from. And I remember the cats were saying stuff like, yo, I brought you back to life. You can never bring something back to life that's great, man. You just letting them hear the greatness of it. It's still of their essence. Their essence is still in there. Now you adding your essence to it, which may bring it a new life and a new set of energy. But it's like we don't res we it's like we we got this infighting thing going on. Right. Um, and I think that too many times. Rappers want to be R&B singers and R&B singers want to be rappers instead of people being who they are. Like Drake is both. <laughs> you understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? He can do both. Smooth B can do both. You know what I'm saying? Stevie D can do both. I could do both. But how many people are going to remember that me, Smooth, and, and Stevie D could do, you know what I'm saying? That we, mm -hmm. could all, that we did it before Drake did it. And right. that's not to say nothing from him because Drake is a great artist. Mm -hmm. and, he's, and what he's done eclipses everything we could possibly think that we could possibly do or would mm. have done but the reality of the matter is is that it came from someplace right and it didn't start there and right. that's the problem it's like we too much time we don't get not saying he doesn't but i'm saying others too right. many times we don't get back to them to, to the greats that that right. influenced us and motivated us to be right. where we are right and what was your take on this four-man group from you see the state on the shirt when they got a hold on Uptown Jodeci, when they had the R&B sound and the hip hop look, and you're like, oh, these guys can really blow. And Devontae, no joke behind the boards and writing. Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, 
when when I first heard of Jodeci, you know what I'm saying, I was still in Whistle. Um, my homegirl, um, Shireen, um, which is Sinquist from Finesse and Sinquist, um, had let us hear some stuff from Jodeci. Um, of course, Devontae and Kyle West, huge influence on, on like what me, Mike Free does um, as far as production is concerned. Um, Cause we was all around that, that time frame. We was all trying to come up. Um, so we was all influenced by each other. Um, but um, you, you know what it was with Jodeci with me? I, and I'm just going to be honest. Go ahead. I love Jodeci the group. What I didn't like was them being New York hip hop. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's like Puffy took them and gave them a New York personality. But they was, you know, they was singers. And I think that when I seen them, not on record, record, I don't, but I seen them. And when I seen them back then, they was real arrogant. And I'm just keeping it a thousand. Like it ain't no hate, it ain't no shade, but it was, it wasn't until I saw them at Uptown. We had a meeting at Uptown one day and I saw all of them that it was love. But whenever I saw them, now granted, when I saw them, we was all outside. We used to hang at this bar um, that Jason Williams that used to play for the Nets had. Mm -hmm. We could have all been twisted, lit, and all the rest of that. And I was young then, too. I was younger then. So I'm not even I'm not even coming at it like, yo, what? It just came across, they just came across as being arrogant. And, you know, with a New York dude, I'm just gonna keep it a thousand. When when you not built like you say you built, we gonna call you on it, man. And we can smell if you real or not. Because a dude that don't lift a thousand pounds ain't gonna walk around like he can lift a thousand pounds. You understand what I'm saying? Mm. He gonna, you know, it, it's just we don't we don't really we don't like the fronting, man. We don't like the fraudulence. So if you gonna be authentic, be authentic. Like to me, like you know, I do say bring that same energy. Bring that same energy everywhere you go. Like if I'm, if 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 somebody say yo jazz is gonna bark, jazz, I'ma probably bark. Like it ain't like, and I'm not no tough guy. I'm just saying, I'm just gonna bark. That's I think that's what it was. I think that when I first saw them, I wasn't really. I'm talking about in person, not on record. When I on record, but the funny thing is that a diary of my a mad band, my favorite Jodeci album. Love it, <laughs> love it. Still love them. Still think they're one of the dopest R&B groups ever. Period, but I just I just wasn't feeling the arrogance, and you know what I'm saying. Um, the swag, yes, the arrogance. Eh, I, I could have left that, but you know, when you large and and people stressing you and sweating you, you know what I mean. <laughs> right. Sometimes that feeds that ego. You feel yeah. me? Yeah. Speaking of uptown, are you familiar with uh, R&B singer by the name of Nesto Velasquez? Yes, I am. Free and I actually. Did a song that ended up being on what what was supposed to be the group home album, um, go group home productions album, um, called something about you. We had done a demo to try to to shop to him. So yes, we knew we we um we actually was trying to do some songs for Nesto. Okay, I did an interview with Nesto years ago. Okay, and he was telling me that um he was originally supposed to have been in Barrio Boys, who I felt should have blown up more, but he put out a record mm -hmm. called Personality on Uptown. It was blowing, yeah. and this was right around when labels were shut down for the fourth quarter, resume at the mm -hmm. top of the year. And by the time mm -hmm. the top of the year came out, there was really no one to push. And yeah. that's why we got no album. I thought he was so dope. Christopher Wims' vocals sound very similar, and this mm -hmm. was before the whole Latin boom in America took off. Mm -hmm. I mean, Nesso was definitely doing his thing. That's why we wanted to, you know what I'm saying? That's why we, um, we was trying to work with him. Um, same thing. Tony Sunshine is dope too. Um, it, it, New York City, man. I I promise you, dog. It, it, we probably got more throwaway singers as far as like people that just don't get on yeah. and and really can blow like really. And yeah. I don't know no real on some real like yo. I can sing, sing like mm -hmm. yo. Give me a mic. And I'm going to blow this point up. Yeah. Right. Because like you crazy. mentioned 
you mentioned Prince Marky D earlier, who mm -hmm. production wise, a beast. That album free. No doubt. Him and Prince Marky D in the and, with mm -hmm. Corey Rooney. Soul Convention. So, and Corey Rooney. Yes. I thought Menagerie should have blown up. That was Tito. Tito realized, was in that group. 18 and Nova make you climb. Man, Menagerie was so dope. Before it's time, man. Before it's time, man. Um, you know, sometimes I'm gonna tell you something. Um, there's some there's certain acts that I feel like was just before they time. Um, Father MC, I felt like it was before his time. Cause I don't understand how his second album, Close to You, didn't do Yo, that. That album, so dope. I, I don't understand. I don't understand how that, that wasn't like at least a, a triple platinum album, intro. just based on the formula. Intro, I don't understand how that's not double platinum. Rest in peace. That peace every man. everybody had, you know what I'm saying? Everybody had the intro joint. Everybody, everybody had that. Intro. There's no way you didn't have that intro album. That and SWV. You understand what I'm saying? But that's what I'm trying to say. It's like there was a wave of music. And 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 I'm gonna tell you something too. Unfortunately, when it comes to black groups and when it comes to R&B groups, they only gonna push for so many. It's not the same way for like pop groups and rock groups. It's just not. You could have you could have five dope rock groups and they'll push them all, but black they don't do it. So right. we had that rush. That was that Jade. That was that intro. That was that um, Jodeci. Um, and Vogue was still popping then. Um, Tony, 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 you know, you had this wave, man. You had this, this new blood that was coming. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Um, father was part of that. Um, the girls, I'll be sure. Um, guy, um, Rex in effect. Basic. You had basic black, you know what I'm saying? But see, basic black to me sounded too much like guy. Like it was just too much like, okay, this is guy. You know what I'm saying? In a full group. You know what I'm saying? But you had today, um, you know, um, um, Rich the, Nice, MC the real Trouble. Seduction. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, man. I mean, it was, it was, it was a lot of that wave, man. Um some people made it past and some people didn't. And it wasn't even because they wasn't dope. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's like you can't tell me I was watching that dude DJ Cassidy, right? Mm -hmm. and he had like Free was on there with him and Eric was on there doing too hype but you know what I'm saying it was Keep was on there with Make It Last Forever and then you know um, the lead singer or you know what I'm saying from Jade um, was singing Don't Walk Away and I'm sitting there and then Shawnee's got on and I'm sitting there listening to these songs and, and I'm like yo these dudes these were some, some good records man like these weren't no corny uh, you know these are some hit records, well-produced records. And some people made it through. Some people didn't. Right. It's, it's definitely you know? kind of like survival of the fittest. And the funny thing about, you know, you have certain lanes where only one can be pushed, while other lanes, multiple groups can be pushed. I look at the situation with Backstreet Boys and NSYNC. Both created by the infamous Lou Pearlman, Backstreet came out first, figured, hey, I struck gold once. Let me see if I can do it again. And the funny thing was, Bashy Boys didn't know anything about NSYNC until somebody slipped and played a tape of them. Mm -hmm. But think about it like this. You got Backstreet Boys, you got NSYNC, and you got um, New Kids on the Block. You understand what I'm saying? You got them three. Boy bands. And ain't nobody telling them they can't. You 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 know you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They decided when they're gonna take a hiatus. But then when you got us, it's like you can't have. Um, it's like it's it's almost like if you think about it. And and um, I'm a little older than you, <laughs> so, but. I want you to think about when God's first album was out, I'll be sure his album was out. Mary's album was out. Jodeci's album was out. I'll be sure his album was out. Bobby's album was out. Janet's album was out. New Edition's album was out. 
the greatest time of R&B history. Mm -hmm. And for me Think to be it. a little kid during those times when those albums were out, I was glad to have been reared during that great time in music. I remember being, you know, seven going on eight when Intro's album dropped, six going yep. on seven when What's the 411 dropped, you know, mm -hmm. and, and just thinking like, man, this is some good stuff. And to think about it, that a lot of the kids that were listening to your top 40 stations were listening to R&B because there's some footage of um, when Justin, Brittany, and JC were on Mickey Mouse Club. They were doing Don't Walk Away by Jade, Real Love, Mary J, Week, SWV, Here We Go Again, Portrait, Off of Love, Color Me Bad. So they were mm -hmm. listening to pretty much New Jet Swing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's and that was the influence that they had, man. Um, but you know, music is the, see the thing about music that's beautiful is that, especially now, is that you don't need a record company to put it out. Do it yourself, and that's where I'm at. I'm I'm I just do it for me. I I just do it for me and for anybody that wants to hear it. It's free. Right. It almost you know kind of felt like, you know, what Prince was doing when he was having his issues with Warner Brothers mm -hmm. falling slave on the face. He was trying to mm -hmm. tell you then, do it yourself, own your stuff. You don't need a middleman. Put it out directly to the people. Be That's free true. of everything. Get rid of these. Yeah, you're right. So, you know, but for the most part, man, like I said, um, you know, I, I'm still writing. I'm still singing. Um I, I'm. I never wanted to be famous. I still don't. I, I. You know, if I could put out records and and go do like little theaters, and shows, and nobody like knows me, knows me, but they know me, <laughs> I probably would be good. I like being home, man. I like being a dad, and I like being, um, you know, uh, just you know, I got a, a grandson and a granddaughter now. Um, my daughter actually is getting ready to have another um um her second child she has my grandson already thank you um my oldest daughter but um you know dog i love music i don't like the music business because the music business is like hollywood it's not real and it it doesn't allow you to be creative it allows you to be Re, it is uh, to regurgitate what's already out there. Fast food and I just, Yeah, and I and I didn't grow up on that. You know what I'm saying? The era that I grew up, the cloth that I'm cut from is that you had to be original, and if you wasn't original, you didn't get no shine, you didn't get no burn. Um, so that's honestly where I'm at with it, man. I'm I'm I still do it. Me and Free still work together. Um, I we actually on my on the project that I have called Lovers Lane. Um, which is like I, I have an um, you know, Mr. Jazz Lover. That's what I go by now, Mr. Jazz Lover. Um, I have a SoundCloud page. Um, my Instagram is Mr. Jazz Lover. Um I also have a YouTube page, Mr. Jazz Lover. You can go there and, and listen to um, you know what I'm saying, some of the stuff that I'm doing now. Uh Free's done he's done more the songs on there that I have now, he's done two. But he's done more than that. I just haven't um put them out he did the two songs that he did on the project that i just worked on and i actually have been working on since 2013 to be honest with you um was ultimate kiss and panties that was the two songs that he he did that i worked with him on okay. on um, my project but you know i'm still doing it man i'm just doing it on the low that's all right L low key like koala now what was your take on when the whole movement out of Atlanta just exploded nationwide, what LA and Babyface is putting out with the face, TLC, Usher, Outkast, and how Atlanta is just a big community and everybody was like, hey, you know, Dallas is on, so JD is going to get on and everybody's just working with everybody, organized noise, Dungeon Family, PA, Parental Advisory, that whole movement down in the A. Um, I was I was happy about it. I mean, I don't I don't hate on no movement. I didn't hate on LA's movement. Um, I don't hate on Texas movement. I don't hate on nobody's movement. Um, Midwest, Latino, whatever, Caribbean. I don't hate on no movement because I feel like everybody has their lane. And all that does is show 
to me, if you don't think that Stevie sharpened Marvin, you understand what I'm saying? Which helped sharpen Michael or Levi or the OJs. They, every steel sharpens steel. You understand what I'm saying? So when you dope, all you do is is make me look at it and be like, okay, I may not do it in the same vibe that you do, but I know the vibe. I won't do it in the same way you would do it, but the vibe is the same. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's like, like I think Bumpy Knuckles is a dope MC. And I thought that Sean Price was a dope MC. But the sad thing is that I didn't realize how dope Sean Price was so after he passed. I started feeling him before he passed, but once he passed, I really dug into his stuff. Same thing with Jay Dilla. Um, but all that does is motivate you. Right. It gives you something to build off of. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because I can find beauty in their sound and hopefully they find beauty in my sound, which will motivate them to do it. Like, yo, that jazz record I heard made me do this. You see mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. Same thing, the same thing. Like, I'll do, yo, that JD joint. Like, I remember JD did this joint with um, Ino Kamosi in, in The Brat, um, where he did this remix, and he used um, the um, the the microphone fiend sample. The boom, 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 boom. But he flipped it, and he had it going, boom, 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 boom. And he just kept playing it like that. And I was like, yo, that's crazy. I like that. Wow. that but that's that what I'm so, saying. That is so dope. You know how they took the schoolboy crush at his white band joint and, and flipped, flipped it, it. And it made me glad now to see my home state, North Carolina, <laughs> finally getting <laughs> shine, you know, but it started with little Definitely. brother. You know, yes. shout out to Fonte Knife and Knife Pooh, Wonder, Rhapsody, mm -hmm. J. Cole, The Baby, mm -hmm. DJ Luke Nasty. You know, mm -hmm. to see, you know, North Carolina finally getting this long overdue. And the, and the funny thing about with Rhapsody is a friend of mine who I went to middle school and high school with actually plays keyboards in her band. Okay, that's what's up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so, so it's definitely feeling good to see North Carolina on the map nationwide. And My my boy, my boy, I'm no reason from here. He's from North Carolina, born and raised. Um, it, dog, it, talent is talent, man. And no matter where you go, you're going to find it. You just got to look for it. And you just got to be open to it. Um, you know, and I think that's one of the things that I learned when I went, when I was in Whistle. I would go to different places. Like when I heard LA Dream Team, I liked them. When I heard Hammer, I liked them. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. When I saw Troop, okay, they had the Jerry Curls, but I liked them. It didn't stop me from liking them. It didn't stop me right. from liking LaVert or whatever, because a dope record is always a dope record. You understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Right. You could talk to me about all the Jerry Curl juice you want in the world about Casanova. It don't take away the dopeness of that song. A, Do you know what I'm saying? Record, it's a hot record no matter where it's from. No matter you know, what. A dope song is trunk. a dope song. Pop, it feels like we're back to that era now with the internet and anybody mm -hmm. that has the equipment, the tools can put it out there. It's almost like pop the trunk. People like it. They like it. If they don't, they don't. And if it's good, they'll find it. That may be true. Definitely. Um, but, you know... Everything has a way of evolving, man. And, and um, you know, I'm just a kid from Brooklyn that wanted to make a record. And I got to do that. Um, I got to travel the world with, with some of, of my closest brothers. Um, and I loved them. Um, you know, it, it, it brought me my children. Um, it, it gave me, you know, it helped me achieve a dream. Um, and it made me realize the gift that I was blessed with. Um, and it also, you know, it brought me, you know, three of, of my closest um, friends are from music. And that's, that's Free, my man Mike, and Norizi. They, they all come from that. So my point is that, dog, regardless of anything, the first thing that you got to be in life is real and a human being. And you got to look at life 
from all aspects and all sides and all walks. When you do that and you open yourself up to different things, then you can expand your mind, open your mind and, and give the world a gift, whether it be an oral, oral gift, whether it be a handwritten gift, whether it be a physically manifestation, mess, you know what I'm saying, that you manifested, you, you know, manifest, excuse me, mm -hmm. yourself. It's still a situation where it's created based on a gift, man. And I was just blessed to, um, to you know, be given a gift and, and able to share it and able to, um, you know, do things that people only dream about doing. And I'm happy. I, I don't. I don't feel like I've made. Um, it was never about money for me. It would have been nice, <laughs> but it was never about money for me. It was always about the music and still is. Right. Current projects, shout outs, and plug your social media. Um. Once again, Mr. Jazz Lover on Instagram, Mr. Jazz Lover on um, SoundCloud. I'm on Twitter, but I don't really tweet like that, so it ain't even worth me saying the name. Um. I definitely want to shout out my kids, my, my babies. I love them. Um, I definitely want to shout out my family. I definitely want to shout out my production team, The Real, um, my man, Mike Keys, and um, Norizi. Definitely much love to my big brother, Free, and, and um, my group, Whistle. I love them. And and thank you. And, and definitely thanks and appreciation to Howie and Kango um, for, you know, all that they contributed to, to my growth and um, where I am today. Um, I appreciate you, brother, um, for, for definitely interviewing me. Um, I definitely want to give a little shout out to my man, Smooth B. He just, he, he got a, a, a big record right now, but, um, he just had a tragic loss. Um, his, his, his wife, his angel, his, his earth, um, transitioned, um, about a month ago. And, um, I definitely want to, you know, let my, my, my brother know, I, I've, I've already hit him up and let him know, but definitely not, let the God know that I love him and that, you know what I'm saying? We, we, we hear from him and we gonna, we gonna rock with him to the end. Um, if there's anybody else that I forgot, blame it on my head, not my heart. You know, this is like the second interview I've done since I left whistle and the first one I've done <laughs> where's, you know, I'm on a zoom. Um, but, um, Definitely, I want to thank you, brother. Um, if there's anything you need, if there's anything I can help you with, please don't don't hesitate to reach out. You know what I'm saying? Um, as I told you off camera and I'll tell you on camera, I said, yo, if you family, if, if you good with free, you automatically good with me. That's my OG. I moved like that with him. So it's, it's definitely love. Um, and I appreciate you, man. Likewise. Oh, you said projects. You said projects. I do have a... Um, it's an independent project. It's, you don't, you, you know, it's not purchased or anything like that. It's called Lover's Lane. It's not really a collective. You could buy it. You can listen to it on my Instagram page. You can find a link um, that'll take you to my SoundCloud page or my um, my YouTube page. And it's Mr. Jazz Lover. That's M-I-S-T-A-J-A-Z-Z-L-U-V-A-H, one word. Um definitely go go there and um check out my songs i hope y'all like them and um definitely feel free to leave some feedback um i am working on some stuff now i don't know um you know when or what i'm gonna do i got some ideas i'm gonna do what they call a boom bap r&b project also i want to do a remake project and i also want to do an all ballad album so i'm not really sure what i'm gonna do first next um i'm just starting um, also, I want to give a shout out to my man, Paul, um, Paul Leo. He's coming out. He's, he's up and coming, man. He's, he's one of my youngins. Um, we about to do some stuff together, um, and drop some singles for him, man. I'm trying to get him bubbling. Um, definitely incredible talent from Brooklyn, Flatbush, Brooklyn. Um, you know where I'm from. So definitely wanted to shout them out, man. And, right. um, I appreciate you. All right, and we look forward to all the projects that you got coming out. You can catch this interview on all streaming platforms where you can hear Beyond the Album Cover and on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash j 5 where you get the video version of this interview along with every past episode of Beyond the Album Cover and archives from my previous incarnation, The Time Machine. Ladies and gentlemen, Jazz from Whistle on Beyond the Album Cover. Thank you so very much for taking the time and doing this interview. I appreciate you, dog. No problem.